Thank you so much. Can everyone hear me? We can hear you fine. Thank okay, you. Okay, great. Well, I have to tell you, that was the best welcome I've gotten in a Zoom chat Morning. ever. <laughs> really great to be on the program. I, I, um, I'm especially grateful because often dentistry is, uh, is left out in the, in the wellness world. So I, I, I have so many great things to share with everyone. And I'm really, really excited. I actually have a guide that everyone who's, uh, who's subscribed is, uh, we, we, have a, we have a free guide, which is gonna cover a lot of the things that I'm, I'm speaking about today. Um, because the health of your mouth is on the front line. You know, in Ayurveda, they say, you cannot have a clean body without a clean mouth, free of disease and toxicity. So we're gonna be talking about the top 10 sources of chronic inflammation and toxicity in the mouth. I have an interesting presentation. I'm looking forward to your questions. I always get a lot of good questions after I present this. Uh, and we're going to, I'm gonna share the screen with you now. But we're going to look at um, basically, um, and, and this is especially poignant after the, uh, the pandemic that we have come through, still coming through, and that the states of health or disease are really the expressions of the success or failure uh, by us, the organism, in, its, in our efforts to respond adaptively, respond adaptively to environmental challenges. And we really can't do that if there is toxicity and inflammation in your mouth. Um, I often like to say the, you know, the 800 pound gorilla in the wellness room is, um, is oral health. You, you really literally cannot be talking about detoxing, um, diet and nutrition and all these other things without really addressing um, that 800 pound gorilla. Um, all right, let's see. We are, um, you know, conventionally in dentistry, 150 years ago, they unplugged dentistry from medicine. It was one of the most illogical moves. Uh, many places in Europe and Switzerland, if you study to become a dentist, you, you basically start in medical school, and then it is a subspecialty. So this was very unnatural to me. That's my bitmoji on the lower right. <laughs> and... Um, I became very fascinated with the work of Dr. Weston Price, a dentist. Um, he wrote a seminal work called Nutrition and Physical Degeneration in 1939. But prior to that, and I really refer to Dr. Price as the father of the Mouth Body Connection, the book that I, that I uh, wrote uh, a few years ago. But in 1917, he was speaking about the knowledge of our relationship of mouth infection to systemic disease um, to a fledgling American Dental Association um, uh, meeting in St. Louis, and it was um, scoffed at. Uh, they did not believe uh, that what goes on in your mouth has profound effects on what's going on in the body. So my book, uh, The Mouth Body Connection, was really looking at the mouth as a mirror and gateway for disease and, and toxicity in the body. And indeed the mouth is a mirror and all of these conditions on the left side of your screen have manifestations in the mouth, including leukemia and, and uh, diabetes and, and, and uh, tuberculosis, uh, all of these HIV AIDS. Um, I went into practice in the early 1980s and it was really surprising the oral manifestations of HIV and AIDS uh, that were clear signs in the mouth. Uh, Chinese medicine has traditionally looked at your tongue as, as a vital diagnostic tool. Everything from even psoriasis skin disorder to you know, vitamin deficiencies and um, fungal infections like candida and all that have manifestations on the tongue. Uh, we one of the most fascinating um, uh, uh, things that I discovered in, in my study of biologic medicine was this connection of each tooth to an organ system in the body through uh, pathways, uh, acupuncture meridians, and we have a, an entire chart. And I, I have 
removed infected root canals on molars and have seen uh, a patient, for example, um, taking out, had an infected root canal on tooth number 19. You see that on the lower right. And she had a tumor that was taking up two thirds of her lung. That tumor spontaneously uh, resorbed. Our bodies have this amazing ability to self-regulate and heal. And, and our bodies want to heal. We have this life force that gives us this divine capacity to heal. When we understand blockages in, in, in not only energetic pathways, but um, we have um, biologic um, meridians, um, biochemical pathways, even psycho-emotional uh, issues and spiritual disconnect, which is often not talked about in medicine. So the tooth organ relationship was an eye-opener for me uh, 25, 30 years ago, and, and I routinely refer to it. And I often ask patients who have, for example, root canals uh, um, on upper molars, upper posterior molars, and asking if they're experiencing any problem with thyroid dysregulation or breast issues, um, even breast cancer. So we know the mouth is um, especially a gateway to heart disease, respiratory problems, diabetes, rheumatoid arthritis, and lots of different types of cancer. Um, the mouth is an inflammatory pathway. As a matter of fact, it's the body's number one source of chronic low-grade inflammation. And so the top 10 sources of chronic inflammation and toxicity we're going to talk about this morning, and a lot of you are going to have aha moments. Uh, we're going to talk about gum disease um, being the largest source of chronic low-grade inflammation. We're going to talk about these things called cavitations. You may have heard of it. Um, it's basically a hole in the jawbone, or it's also referred to as jaw osteonecrosis or cavitational osteonecrosis. We're going to talk about the notorious amalgam fillings, which always seem barbaric to me, that would, we would stick an amalgam, which is 52% mercury, uh, two inches from the brain. And we're going to look at the correlation of dental mercury and amalgam to um, Alzheimer's disease and dementia. And the symptoms being the same, mercury toxicity and Alzheimer's disease. Going to talk about other sources of heavy metals like nickel that's found in non-precious porcelain fused to metal crowns. Um, we're going to look at metal implants, which many uh, people have had over the past 20 years of uh, titanium metal implants and studies coming out that show that these metal implants, titanium, is inflammatory to the human body. And there are people that have titanium hips and shoulders and all kinds of prosthetic replacement using titanium metal. And that it's not pure titanium, that there are other alloys in there. But titanium does corrode and, and there are titanium particles that embed themselves in the liver and kidneys and uh, lungs. We're gonna look at root canal teeth and the effects that these have on chronic inflammation in the whole body. Um, tooth colored fillings, um, such as um, plastic composite fillings uh, that are loaded with bisphenol, BPA. Um, a big one, number eight, uh, we're gonna check out a billion people on the planet are suffocating in their sleep and obstructive sleep apnea and upper airway restriction and airway disease is a major, major debilitating problem for the entire body. And it's linked to everything from high blood pressure to diabetes, to um, uh, stroke, early dementia, all of these things. Um, TMJ dysfunction and occlusal disease, very debilitating, major source of inflammation in the whole body. And then we're gonna talk about oral care products. And we're gonna finish with that because that's a really interesting one because all of you who are listening, uh, probably walk down the toothpaste aisle, totally confused. So we're going to get into all of that. Um, let's start with gum disease. We have 85% of adults over 35 uh, have some form of gum disease. It's basically epidemic. The link between gum disease to systemic illness is well established and past approaches of products like Listerine, kill germs on contact and Colgate Total and all these other things um, that are taken antibiotic or antimicrobial approach are not only ineffectual, but harmful. 
Gum disease is a major, major source of chronic problems in the entire body for men and for women. So we look at, you know, a, a real surprising statistic for men. If you have gum disease, you're three times more likely to be impotent. You're 14 percent more likely to develop cancers, kidney cancer, 49 percent higher risk, pancreatic cancer, 54 percent. A study from Harvard University, 67 percent higher risk, blood cancers and diabetes. And for women, major, major problems with gum disease and um premature low weight babies and uh, preeclampsia, a dangerous blood pressure condition, all correlated to inflammation of the gums. And I'm often horrified that a lot of OBGYNs don't even let their patients get a dental cleaning when their gums are all inflamed during pregnancy. It's called pregnancy gingivitis. So we'll talk more about that. Um, but surprisingly, and this should make everyone wake up uh, on this program, inflammation is a link between gum disease and cancer. Chronic inflammation has been associated with a number of systemic diseases and cancer. And it's, it's about um, the regulation of inflammatory mediators um, that mediates the development of cancer cells and, and the effects of harmful bacteria in an imbalanced environment of the mouth, um, they are serious pathogens that can transform a DNA of cells. So um, gum disease is a major source of chronic low-grade inflammation. Um, I did a program at, um, up at Harvard Medical School one summer in complementary and alternative medicine. And this was a book I read on stealth infections and how they cause cancers, heart disease, and other deadly ailments. That was back in the early 90s. Time Magazine on their cover um, had how inflammation is the silent, the stealth infection that everyone has. You know, everyone, gum disease doesn't hurt. You know, I often have patients say, oh, when I brush my teeth, they bleed a little, they always do that, as if that's normal. And I, I often say, if you were combing your scalp and your scalp was bleeding, um, or brushing your scalp and your scalp was bleeding, would you think that was normal? The answer is no, it's a sign of inflammation. So gum disease bacteria, this is April 2015, gum disease bacteria are indeed a catalyst for cancer cell growth. And the big bad bacteria, Fusobacterium nucleatum, it's the most common bacteria in the mouth. So how does it go from benign to what I like to say, badass. <laughs> and, the, and it's all about the environment. It's all about the terrain. So the progression from health to, to disease, from healthy gums to where your gums bleed a little bit when you brush gingivitis to where, oh, wow, my gums are receding and I'm seeing these dark, you know, these red ring around the collar of my teeth. Um, and that's periodontitis to advanced periodontitis, which is, wow, my teeth are getting loose. Um, this is a progression. I often compare it to these pretty brownstones in Brooklyn where everybody's taking care of their porches and, and everything's neat and cleaned up. And how does it go from that to that? And the answer is, it's all about the terrain. You know, bad economic conditions was the terrain here. Um, and certainly bad economic uh, and social policies, uh, welfare policies and things. And people did not take care of things and, and uh, the way they should. And unfortunately, a lot of oral care products are creating this without you even knowing it. So we're going we're gonna to talk about that. So it's really all about balance. You know, it's like that song. It's all about the bass, the bass. It's all about balance, 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 balance of this natural ecology called the oral microbiome. So homeostasis is in the middle and you see that green and yellow, those are aerobic bacteria. So this plaque in the middle of this blue circle is really all about, um, this area here is all about, it's a thin, clear odorless film. When the plaque in your mouth is in this healthy state, it doesn't smell, it's not sticky or smelly, it doesn't cause gum disease. 
But when you disturb it, uh, and there are products out there that disturb it, that's, and, and products that strip it. So the, to the left of your screen is like a desert where there's, you know, if you oil pull constantly, which is a detergent uh, process um, that was described in Ayurveda, oil pulling, which we'll talk about it, it's become very, you know, popular. It's become like a, uh, a, a popular um, technique the reality is, is that oil pulling is fine to take you from the right side of the screen to the middle. But if you oil pull every single day, you're actually stripping the microbiome. Same thing with charcoal and clay. You know, I use charcoal when I take out amalgam mercury fillings. But if you continue to brush with charcoal, not only is it abrasive to your enamel, it strips the microbiome and you end up with this basically desert. So you want this really nice, healthy, organic garden. When you go to the right, you get this thick film. And this thick film has all these spirochetes and all these other things that are very perfect milieu, perfect uh, culture for, for them to propagate and cause inflammation of the gums, which is reflected by this red. So the oral microbiome is made of water, salivary proteins, curricular fluid, immune complexes, minerals, vast numbers of organisms. We now have identified about uh, 1,200 species and, we and they are six to 10 billion in number. And they do amazing things. They transport minerals from saliva for your teeth to heal themselves. They transport ionic minerals from saliva to remineralize your tooth enamel. We're going to talk about that. I get asked all the time, can teeth heal? And the answer is in the enamel, yes. But when you get a deeper cavity into your organic part of the tooth, the dentin, often not. That uh, will need surgical intervention, which is the excavation of decay and a proper restoration to restore the structural integrity of the tooth. But this probe over here that's scraping this stuff off, that is not healthy plaque. That's what we find when the oral microbiome is out of balance. So all of my work and research in the oral microbiome over the past 20 years has all about promoting balance. It's all about the balance. <laughs> I'll give you a song later. <laughs> so how does gum disease lead to Alzheimer's disease, seven different types of cancers, everything from the esophageal cancer, pancreatic cancer, and the number one tum uh, bacteria found in colorectal cancer, colorectal tumors. Yes, bacteria found in colorectal tumors are Fusobacterium nucleatum, the most common bacteria in the mouth. So how does it get there? Well, there's di the direct effects of oral infectious pathogens, there's the inflammatory response, inflammation, um, the effects of inflammation on your circulatory system. They find bacteria from the gums in plaques around your heart. But the fourth one is the one that's really, really interesting. You're gonna hear a lot about this. And this is the effect of uh, bacteria um, that cause inflammation to create gene, what we call gene polymorphisms. And, and you, be, you develop more pro-inflammatory genotype. So you can, it can go into your circulatory system to the right, or we used to think that these bacteria can't get past the hydrochloric acid of the stomach. Ah, but they do, and they can. And so we, in a recent studies have showed that these oral bacteria, especially people that have terrible diets and they're on protonics to decrease the level of stomach acid, we can have harmful pathogens in the mouth to get all the way down in the large and small intestine. Um, bacteria like Porphyrmonas gingivalis down here, Fusobacterium nucleatum, which I spoke, for, I spoke of, and Klebsiella pneumonia is another uh, bacteria linked to ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease. Wow, a bacteria from the mouth doing that? So the oral microbiome plays a big role in regulating your immune system. I'm going to say it again. Not just allergies, asthma, um, but autoimmunity and primary or acquired immune deficiencies. 
This was very important in regulating your immune system with um, the COVID-19 pandemic. People that struggled uh, and didn't fare well, and they said, oh, this person had no, no problems. You know, they didn't have a heart, heart disease or cancer or anything, and, and they succumbed to COVID-19. Well, you're going to find out that many of us are walking around with toxicity and inflammation. We don't even know it. But gum disease is a big one. It doesn't hurt. Um, you know, most people are, you know, unaware because it's chronic, low-grade inflammation. So all of these things happen. I don't want to bore you with too many technical, technical information, but the oral microbiome regulates the immune system and the immune system helps to regulate the oral microbiome. There is this bi-directional uh, pathway. So let's talk about something many of you may have heard of. It's being talked about a lot. And doctors are talking about it a lot now because we use 3D imaging. And you could see these where regular dental x-rays wouldn't show it. And this is these ideas of an unhealed hole in your jawbone. Wait a minute. I had my wisdom teeth out 40 years ago. I had my wisdom teeth out 40 years ago. How do I have an unhealed hole in my jawbone? Ah, very good question. Because the bone never fully healed, the gums grew over, and now you have this hole that is a source of inflammation. Um, very prominent uh, biologic medical doctor, Dr. Dietrich Klinghardt, often talks about Lyme disease and the Lyme spirochetes look for places to hide. People with Lyme disease often have trouble resolving their Lyme disease if they have these cavitations. And I'll talk about how you get them and we'll go through it together. Um, but it's a silent infection, chronic illness, and chronic inflammation. So this is um, a schematic on the left of what a cavitation looks like. This is a dental x-ray where most dentists will say, oh, the bone dips down, yeah, the tooth was out. And on the right, you can see that indeed, this is a hollow space, um, a hollow mandibular space um, in, in the mandible, actual hole. So we reflected the gums back here. And this is the hole that's represented schematically here. So you could see this thin area of bone on top. So you're not walking around with an open hole, but some people actually have opened many of these cavitations and they're wide open like this. And, uh, and then sometimes they have an eggshell like here, an eggshell of bone covering it. So um, here's a tooth that had a root canal and a lot of doctors say, oh, you know, dentists will say, oh, you got to retreat that root canal. Oh, I'm sorry, excuse me. I'm so sorry, everyone. Uh, really want to, um, okay, just want to get back to where we were. Um, uh, I just lost my Okay. Resume share. There we go. Um, sorry about that. <laughs> if you're over 50, you're not as tech savvy. So um, this is what a cavitation looks like around a root canal. It's pretty ugly. So um, cavitation is an unhealed hole in the jawbone from an extracted um, tooth. And this can often continue and actually damage the nerve in the lower jaw called the mandibular nerve. And these are called, this is um, often patients who have NICO, N-I-C-O, neuralgia-induced cavitational osteonecrosis. Um, often they, um, they have toothaches in teeth. Up. They, they'll come in and they'll beg for this tooth to be extracted because they have this terrible pain and it's often misdiagnosed as a problem tooth. And this tooth has nothing wrong with it. Um, I had a, um, a cousin um, in, in high school. I, I was, um, I, I remember she had her wisdom teeth removed and about four or five months after she started to get this bizarre uh, pain in her jaw. She had multiple teeth extracted by an unknowing dentist. 
And, uh, and then they ended up severing her fifth cranial nerve called the trigeminal nerve. And it was all a Nico lesion from an unhealed cavitation in the jaw that was misdiagnosed. So two-dimensional x-rays don't show this. We started experimenting with 3D, and this is an MRI, but really cone beam, and everyone should write this down, CBCT, everyone on this program, if you haven't had one, you should see a biologic dentist who is skilled in reading a CBCT, because here is, for example, an infection around a front tooth that can't be seen on a regular x-ray. So 3D is the way to go. And CBCT is a great diagnostic gold standard to rule out whether you have cavitations, any infections, any abnormalities in the jaw that can't be seen on a regular panoramic x-ray or a two-dimensional dental x-ray. And so we often uh, read these and I'm teaching other dentists how to read these now because it's a relatively new technology and a lot of dentists aren't skilled in looking for cavitation, cavitations or even knowing what they are. So here is a cavitation that's been diagnosed in a 3D scan. And um, so I have a uh, protocol that we use um, and we use a laser uh, to treat this. And this laser does three things. It gets into the cavitation without trauma, uh, atraumatically. It disinfects the area with ozone, ozone and ozonated water. And it stimulates the regeneration of bone, which is the most exciting one. Regenerative medicine is the biggest turn on for me. Um, and this um, wavelength of light actually stimulates mitotic division of the osteoblast. And in, in English, the cells that make new bone to fill the hole in are called osteoblasts. And when you divide the mitochondria, the, the cells divide. And so you grow bone back faster. So we're able to regenerate bone, which is a fantastic, fantastic thing. And uh, we also use, take blood um, from your arm. You may have heard of PRF, platelet-rich fibrin. It's what we call a smart blood concentrate. And it's platelet-rich fibrin, which is rich in mesenchymal stem cells. The younger you are, the more you have for faster healing. And we are able to augment the bone with biologic biomaterials that come right from you. And it also stimulates bone regeneration. So in this hole, sorry to be so graphic here, but this is how we treat it. And then we put a membrane of this PRF and we cover the gums over that. And the healing is really remarkable, really, really remarkable. This is a fantastic protocol for healing these. Patients report all kinds of improvements in all a myriad of, of conditions from autoimmune conditions, Lyme disease. Um, these are often filled with parasites. The meridian for the third mole is, by the way, everyone, is the pericardium of the heart and the gut. How many people have suffered with gut issues from their teenage years? And they're like, oh yeah, oh, I had my wisdom teeth taken out. And you know, that I started getting gut problems in my, in my 20s. And um, so really, really interesting. Let's get to another notorious source of disease and inflammation that has been staunchly defended by the American Dental Association, which ironically was founded by pro amalgam dentists in the, in the 18, late 1800s. And the American Dental Association held the original patent on um, dental amalgam. So very, very interesting. Um, dental amalgams have now been banned by the um, FDA for pregnant women and children, finally, but they should really be eliminated altogether. But the most important part to remember about mercury fillings is not the fact that they're there, but that they need to be removed safely. So a new amalgam generally looks like this tooth in the middle here. And they teach us in dental school how to, how to carve these. And I'm happy to say I am, I'm on the faculty of New York University's dental school, and they were the first to pull amalgam off the floor. But I'm, I'm really... Um, 
concerned about teaching dental students how to remove these safely and protect themselves, the patients, and their staff, often who are young women and, and um, many dental assistants who are young women or, or childbearing years and um, being exposed to dental mercury is terrible when it's being removed. It's an invisible, odorless, tasteless cloud. So it's not a silver filling. That's a fraudulent misrepresentation because it's only 26% silver. It's 52% mercury. And the amount of mercury from dental amalgam is that red part of the pie. When, if your mercury is high in your blood, by the way, you're really loaded with mercury. And if your doctor says, oh, don't eat tuna or a swordfish and all that, well, fish and seafood is that blue segment. And um, other uh, you know, negligible traces in air and water, coal-fired power plants are all uh, in a very negligible part compared to, and the World Health Organization has said that dental amalgam is the largest source of environmental mercury on the planet. So we have special separators in all our dental offices that are mandated by the EPA to separate out mercury from going into the water supply. But yet 46% of dentists still put this crap in people's teeth and 90% remove it unsafely. So make sure that this is removed safely. Um, there's a uh, dynamic duo of neurodegeneration um, with, um, with mercury. Um, so mercury vapor passes through your cell membranes across your blood brain barrier and into your central nervous system, causing immunological, neurological, and psychological problems. At the same time, mercury is leaching into your saliva and being swallowed, making its way down the digestive tract. A lot of people who have lots of amalgam like this, um, they have a lot of gut issues. And it also damages your immune system. Remember, everyone, your brain is a primary target for heavy metals. And the neurological symptoms are everything from depression, anxiety, irritability, memory loss. And you're speaking to someone who is in a profession. Dentists, when I graduated dental school in 1983, dentists had the highest rates of depression and suicide, the highest rate of suicide. Now, you know, that they, you know, if you remember Alice in Wonderland, the Mad Hatters, the Mad Hatters were using mercury in the brims of top hats. Well, dentists are, a lot of dentists are Mad Hatters and, um, and they're working, um, absorbing this mercury vapor. And there's a lot of um, Parkinsonism, Alzheimer's, dementia, all of these things related to mercury exposure. And so... This is an interesting uh, slide, a little hard to read, but that blue box at the top there, the symptoms of mercury toxicity and Alzheimer's disease are identical. So if you look, the irritability, anxiety, depression, memory loss, agitation, so on and so forth, identical. So it's the same biochemical hallmarks of Alzheimer's disease. We need to eliminate the use of this in every patient. And we need every dentist to understand the safe removal. Um, so inorganic mercury does, this was a study um, not that long ago um, that talked about, yes, that inorganic mercury plays a major role in Alzheimer's disease. Um, and um, it, it uh, exposure to mercury causes the formation of neurofibrillar uh, tangles and also amyloid plaques. So uh, I, we can go on and on. I was a producer of this um, film. Um, this was uh, evidence of harm. Uh, and, and this was a brilliant documentary that goes into the, all of the politics and all of the history of the use of dental amalgam. You can get this online, I think even at Amazon. Um, you can see clips of this or you can actually download the whole. I'd really recommend um, uh, that everyone take a look at it. We're gonna go on to other sources of heavy metals. So everyone is aware. I realize we're gonna finish this presentation and everyone's gonna go, oh my God, <laughs> I've got at least two or three of these in my mouth. Some people have more. So. We'll, I'll, I'll be happy to answer questions and give you kind of uh, the, the good. The important thing to realize is 
is that we're fixable. We're fixable. So getting this toxicity out is an important step, but we are fixable. Um, so there is a, um, uh, the next um, area is these, um, you know, these look like, oh, these are porcelain, right? No, it's a metal thimble with porcelain on top. And often, if you look at the lower uh, left side, you'll see wearing of the porcelain off of the crown, you're down to the metal. So these are, what's in these? Well, 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 nickel. You know, it's often a toss up. Mercury is really bad, but nickel is carcinogenic. And a lot of the porcelain um, in these, P, they're called PFMs, right? Porcelain fused to metal crowns, PFMs. Um, and we were looking at lead. So lead in the dental porcelain itself is used to create some reflective properties or a sparkling appearance. But a lot of these um, non-precious PFM crowns, you have nickel, lead, arsenic, chromium, cadmium. And, um, and so a lot of these are um, alloys, which are very har harmful. So we're not just looking at mercury, we're looking at other things. Um, there's a discount code called TRUTH1515%. Uh, and um, this was a study looking at the toxicity um, with zebrafish. <laughs> Uh, embryos and, and larvae and, and um, very, very toxic, um, nickel chromium, cobalt chromium, really not good alloys. So let's take a look at another metal, which has traditionally been used in a lot of biologic prosthetics, um, orthopedic devices, but especially dental implants. Um, all of these, look at some of these um, prosthetics in the human body um, from shoulders, hips, knees, chest, people who've had, you know, at car accidents, rebuilding the chest with, with, with metal. Um, and so we, we, it's been around 50 years. And um, when we first did dental implants, uh, one of the founders uh, of, of the original dental implants um, uh, developers of the original dental implants was a uh, hematologist actually who discovered it, Dr. Per Ingbar uh, Branamark. Uh, per Ingbar Branamark um, was doing um, uh, um, studies on bone marrows and femurs of animals. And he would stick these titanium cylinders into the femur and then he tried to retrieve it. And he saw that the bone grew around it really quickly. And we thought that, wow, this is fantastic. The bone grows around the implant so fast and well we can give people you know a new a new set of teeth so it was a great thing except when we started to understand that the reason the bone grows so quickly it's inflammation the body's trying it's almost like scar tissue bone growing around it doesn't really even have a good blood supply it's more what we call sclerotic bone and um the the interesting thing about this is that over time Lots of unhealthy things happened. And we would see all of this gum tissue turning almost purple, uh, purple around here. And if you look down here, we see, oh, this scar tissue bone is dissolving around. And if you look at the lower right, look how much bone is lost. What's going on here? What is going on here? We thought these were a good thing. Well, these titanium implants have been shown to be inflammatory. So over long term, they do cause inflammation. And, and at full disclosure, I had one, I had several of these placed in my mouth. I've already removed one and I'm going to remove the other one shortly and replace it with a ceramic or zirconia implant. So zirconium, I don't know if I have any pictures of zirconium, but um, zirconium is a ceramic material. Um, it's often referred to as a white metal, but the bone that grows around it is more vascular. It has a blood supply. So um, that we're going to answer questions at the end. So I know people have their hands up and I'm kind of, uh, I'm sure um, provoking a lot of interest in questions about this, 
but I'll do my best to get to all your questions at the end. And, um, but what I wanted everyone to understand is that these are a source of long-term inflammation. And these are also um, um, a source of corrosion. And there are titanium particles from dental implants that go all over the body. So you see a schematic here um, uh, with the lungs, uh, liver, and the kidneys here. These particles go everywhere. So these titanium particles can be detected on the, on the bone surface right away. And then the concentration of these particles can be distributed in the human body related to the distance it is from that. So obviously the kidneys are furthest from your mouth, but it could also come from your hip. And released from the implant, they enter the blood and migrate to multiple organs. Um, the important thing uh, it to understand here is sometimes these implants are well integrated in bone. And so we really have to make an important decision that it might not be in the best interest to remove these implants and put in a ceramic implant. Um, we may want to monitor it if it isn't corroded, if it doesn't look like this. And it's important to really let patients know that um, there are alternatives to metal implants now. And we have zirconium and we have zirconia bridges where we don't even have to put an implant in the bone. We have um, removable prosthetics as another option, um, not as comfortable. Um, but the, the, uh, the release of titanium particles from implants comes from a lot of different things and it can be stimulated by um, drinking orange juice or um, fluoride is very acidic and we're going to get into fluoride. That's probably the biggest public health disaster uh, of the last uh, 75 years, um, um, dumping a basically hazardous chemical into the water supply under the guise of preventive dentistry. And we'll talk about that a little bit. Um, so let's talk about another notorious source of toxicity and chronic inflammation, and that is root canal, root canals. So when I came out of dental school, I, um, I actually thought root canal was, you know, really a good thing. It was developed. Modern endodontics um, became, basically it was developed after the end of World War II. Um, originally, uh, they were experimenting with using formaldehyde <laughs> in the tooth. So root canal, everyone should understand what a root canal is, right? Um, we go into a tooth, we remove the vital pulp, and we go into the canals that are in the roots, root canals, and we clean them out. We put an in inert material. Now, now it's, it's got a purchase, but originally they were experimenting with something called Sargenti paste which was like a formaldehyde people got really sick very quickly. Now people get sick, but it is a slow progressive depending on them. By the way, there was a movie. I don't know if I have a picture here as a movie on Netflix called Root Cause. Um, that was about someone's experience having a root canal and the mysterious illnesses that he was experiencing, everything from impotence to uh, fatigue and all these other things. And, um, and the crazy road he went on till somebody said, Hey, that could be coming from your root canal. And the, the American association of endodontists, the root canal organization went wild and filed a class action lawsuit saying it was um, um, putting fear and uh, in, in, into and, and misleading the public and that root canals are safe and all this other jazz. And the reality is 100% of root canal teeth, 100% release endotoxins, which are bacterial and bacterial byproducts. 100% of endodontic teeth, endodontically treated teeth, excuse me, have been shown to cause some level of inflammation. And here, if you, if you had a deep cavity like this second picture and you had an abscess here, root canal was believed to clean this out and then this, this heals. And we do see because the source of the infection is coming inside the tooth. But what we have learned in research that's been done is that 
you can't sterilize the tooth. There are thousands of these dental tubules that can trap bacteria that can't be cleaned out by debridement of the root canal. And so you trap these bacteria, many of them become super pathogens, really uh, super bugs, and they can do a lot of, a lot of harm um, if it is not cleaned up or removed. Um, there was a um, colleague of mine, Dr. Stuart Nunnally down in Texas did a meta-analysis of women with breast cancer. And so um, he was looking at root canals on the breast cancer meridian. And it doesn't mean that the infection from the root canal goes on the meridian and goes to the breast. But what we realize is that our immune system is not just biologic, it's energetic. There is a field. It's like Star Trek, you know, when the, when the shield is up and the Klingons fire a missile, um, it bounces off. But when the shield's down, it takes a hit. And so that Klingon could be a cancer cell in our body. We're fighting cancer every day. When our shield is up, we don't get cancer. When our shield is down, you know, lots of, lots of things can happen. So think of it like that. Um, our teeth are like the circuit breakers for the electrical panel box of our body. And when you pop a breaker because of infection or inflammation, that turns that reduces that immune response. The shield goes down. So how a uh, root canal could be making you sick. Um, I'm going to give you what the American Association of Endodontists say. Um, the claim root canals are safe. They say enough of the tissue is removed. The body's immune system can get, can get, can better get on top of any existing infection. We know that that's not true when the immune system is compromised and there are approved substances to fill the tooth. Yes, we don't use formaldehyde and we're using other um, uh, ultrasonic means and even lasers to clean out the teeth and that there's no other suitable options. And so uh, the dentists who claim root canals are not great, I say, one, there's no way to completely remove all the dead tissue from the tooth because I talked about the porosity of a tooth. Your tooth is like a sponge. There's no way to sterilize the tooth, um, thus bacteria, leaving bacteria in the tooth. And the materials used to fill the hollowed out tooth leak and cause problems downstream. All of those are true. And all of those have been documented in research. Um, the American Association of Endodontists states that there's no evidence that root canals could be linked to cancer or any inflammatory diseases. That is just really um, bonkers because the reality is, is you can't make a blanket statement like that. So endotoxins and bacteria are present in 100% in this study back from 2007 of the initial samples, high values of endotoxin were still present in the root canal after seven days of chemomechanical treatment, the conventional root canal treatment and disinfection of the tooth. There's another study from 2015, chronic asymptomatic inflammatory lesions around the apex of the tooth with a necrotic pulp, pulp or insufficient root canal. Um, it can develop unnoticed by the patient and many dentists I put in there and remain so for years. Um, this was the documentary about root canals. You could probably go to YouTube and look this up, root cause. Um, this got pulled because uh, just everyone knows there are 25 million root canals done by dentists uh, in the United States a year, 40 million globally. Um, a root canal averages over $2,000 per treatment. Dental insurance covers it um, if you're lucky to have some insurance, even though dental insurance is, is terrible. Um, but you have $2,000 times 25 million. I, I don't know where that goes. I think it's bigger than the national debt. <laughs> but anyway, um, that's uh, the amount of money at stake. Um, if we nix um, root canals as a health option for the patient. So you could bet 
Now, if they're a dentist, this is all they do. This is their specialty as endodontists. I call them, you know, and I have some dear friends and I feel terrible, but uh, I call them uh, ended, um, I call them the undertakers in the dental profession, the undertakers of the teeth, right? They're embalming, embalming teeth, keeping them in your head. You know, root, root canal is the only procedure where we keep something dead inside you. We don't do root canals on bones, on the gallbladder, on your appendix. Uh, so, uh, yeah, this is, I've, I've, I've really kind of changed my opinion and um, considerably. Um, whereas I look very warily at chronic root canals and the way we're able to see infection around root canals much more effectively is by um, 3D cone beam. A two-dimensional x-ray does not show it, um, but we can see uh, areas of inflammation and infection around root canal more easily with a 3D cone beam. So these are the paths of, of infection inside or outside of the root canals. And um, this is um, a histological slide showing inflammation. Most dentists would look at these x-rays on the left uh, and say, wow, that root canal looks good. It's filled perfectly. There's really an art to doing this, by the way, just like there's an art to embalming a body. There's an art to doing this. You know, I, I often laugh because when it's, when a root canal is first done, it seems totally benign and fine. And then 10 years down the road. And I remembered, you know, in, in my family, big Italian family, and there was a family undertaker and, 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 you know, there'd be a, an aunt who died and she'd be laid out and awake and everybody would be saying, Oh, she looks like she's sleeping. She's beautiful. And I kept thinking as a teenager, well, I wonder what she looks like if you dig her up in 10 years. You know, and that's kind of like a root canal. <laughs> so inflammation, um, the accumulation of cholesterol crystals. Um, this is another interesting phenomenon. Um, these uh, cholesterol cri um, crystals in the form of clefts are, are, are found in, in and, and they cause a foreign body reaction. Again, this is a foreign body reaction. And it's a source of inflammation. These cholesterol crystals come from red blood cells um, uh, disintegrating. And, um, so what does it look like when you take out a diseased root canal? It's that tooth on the right. Sorry. I hope no one's eating <laughs> the, um, we see some really disgusting things when we take out an infected root canal. Sometimes this is called scar tissue. And the reality is no, many times it's this. So um, this is probably the most um, gross thing that was ever developed in dentistry. These are root canals that are failing where the teeth are disintegrating. And there's a procedure called an apicoectomy. If a dentist ever recommends an apicoectomy or retreating your root canal, I want you to get up out of the chair and run out the door because more than, uh, I, I would say, greatest percentage are going to fail. So here is a ridiculous, hopeless attempt at saving a root canal. But what's being done here? They cut the gum, flap it back, drill out the infected, diseased end of the tooth, which is often this part to the right here. And then they go in and they stick amalgam, mercury, into the bone to seal the end of the root. And it's called a retrograde filling. That's what we were taught in dental school. Fortunately, a lot of endodontists don't do these anymore. And they'll be advising you to get them out and do an implant. And they'll stick a titanium implant. And my recommendation from this talk is opt for ceramic zirconia. Um, here is a root canal infection. And here's the infection draining into the nerve and blood supply causing cavitation. That's what you see on 3D, everyone. This is what you see on a 3D scan. Uh, there's a book written by a colleague of mine, um, Robert Kulas. He, um, he and I were in dental school together. He was a great, um, very talented dental student. Um, I was, um, we were class presidents. He was a few years younger than me. Um, I was president of my class and he was, president of his class, he was a leader, really loved dentistry, and they took his license away because of this book. 
They took his license away because he was speaking about the dangers of root canal and uh, with arthritis, heart disease, neurodegenerative disease, digestive disorders, mental disorders, and cancer. And um, Thomas Levy is a medical doctor, is also a lawyer um, who has um, been an author with this book. But um, yeah, he was, uh, um, Bob was recommending getting your root canals removed. And just for the fact that he was doing this a number of years ago, they went after him for his license. And uh, I'm really disgusted by that because um, he had, and there is enough research that exists out there to support offering the patient an alternative to root canal. And if a patient wants a root canal, that's fine. Um, they're not going to get it in my office. Um, they could see an endodontist, but, um, you know, we, we always offer, you know, we're required um, by our standard of care under the state education department uh, for us to offer patients options to treatment. And that's exactly what we do, but I like to educate and teach. And that's why I'm on this program to get today with you. And I really think this is one of the most phenomenal programs uh, that I've ever participated in because of the large number of doctors and professionals and experts and information that all of you are getting. So let's talk about um, tooth colored fillings. And so the plastic fillings that a lot of dentists still do is called bisphenol A glycidyl methacrylate, glycidyl methacrylate. So bis GMA resin. A lot of dentists don't even realize that the bis of bis GMA resin that we use in dentistry is bisphenol A, bis GMA. And it's a major endocrine disruptor. So we had mercury fillings being removed, then putting in plastic fillings. But, you know, you went from mercury to BPA. BPA is a problem. Uh, as a matter of fact, there were sealants in kids. This is a 2012 study on 434 children who had their cavities filled with a white composite resin known as bis-GMA. Um, we saw drops in psychosocial uh, function. Treated kids become more moody, aggressive, generally less well-adjusted. It's been linked to ADD, ADHD. So what do we have? We now have the emergence of BPA-free tooth filling, tooth colored fillings. I introduced a product from Germany. Um, we'll talk about it. Let's see where it is. This is it. It's called Admira Fusion. Um, it is a non-BPA direct universal restorative. So it's a tooth colored filling that we can do that has no BPA. And this is what we use in our office. So what's the deal with BPA? Um, many of you probably know this already. Huge endocrine disruptor, estrogen mimic. It's been linked to breast cancer and, and uh, uh, prostate cancer, neuroblastoma, um, reproductive anomalies, DNA alterations, heart disease, diabetes, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So we got to get BPAs, you know, people, you know, it, it's really interesting. Even in toothpaste, um, we were putting um, triclosan copolymer with, with chlorinated water. It converts to chloroform. Uh, and it's a non-biodegradable pesticide. And it was the EPA that was petitioning the FDA, take it out of toothpaste and uh, household products. And um, Colgate quietly removed it and, and put in a, another ingredient for their Colgate Total product. Um, but at any rate, um, we see these things where BPAs, we're, we're so you know, concerned about the environment and not drinking out of a plastic water bottle and, and a hot car that has BPA in its plastic, but you could have it in your mouth, which is warm. And when you grind your teeth and chew, you're swallowing this stuff. So um, again, I actually use a safe removal protocol for plastic fillings. And, and I, again, we're going to talk about this at the end. And I know there are a lot of hands up. I'm actually happy that I'm striking a chord because I want, I want to give you a rational protocol for how you should look at this. If you have a tooth colored filling that's in, and the margins of sound and, or you have a dental amalgam 
where the margins are sound and you have no autoimmune issues or any other problems. I don't want you to run out there and rip out your amalgams or rip out your BPA fillings or rip out your root canals. I want you to have a sound protocol. But if those fillings are leaking, if they are wearing down, they should be removed safely and replaced with a non-BPA containing restorative material or a ceramic implant. If it's a metal implant that's failing or a root canal that's failing or an, you know, an amalgam, and like I said. So we're, we'll talk about that. We do not live in a perfect world, everyone. So I I'm just want everyone to be conscious. We're raising our consciousness here for how we should be taking care of ourselves from the mouth to the body. And that's why I wrote that book. So we're going to get to, um, this is a biggie, um, number eight, and there's only three left. I want to see how I'm doing on time. I think I'm okay. Uh, so we are, um, we are going to talk about obstructive sleep apnea and airway disease. A billion people on the planet um, suffer from obstructive sleep apnea. Um, over 80% of obstructive sleep apnea has to do with a compromised airway. And that compromised airway is what's going on in your mouth, often the tongue. The tongue in your mouth may be tied. Your arch of your mouth may be narrow because you had teeth pulled for orthodontic purposes or you lost teeth or you had braces and Invisalign and they kept moving the teeth and making it and making the arch smaller. A very um, uh, good friend of mine who wrote a book, Six Foot Tiger, Three Foot Cage. For many people who have sleep apnea, the six foot tiger is your tongue, the three foot cage is your mouth. So correction of obstructive sleep apnea and we use the Vivos method, the Vivos system is an appliance therapy that stimulates stem cells, remodeling the bone, expanding the airway for you to be able to breathe. But let's talk about the dangers of sleep apnea and why this is a source of chronic inflammation, toxicity, and death. And death. 25% um, of middle-aged men, 75% um, of severe cases are undiagnosed. So one in 15 adults have a severe OSA, one in five have mild. And it's linked to a lot of things. Everything from, you know, car accidents to hypertension, heart attack, stroke, memory loss, diabetes, depression. If you're not breathing at night, you're depressed. Bedwetting in children. If you have to get up and go to the bathroom multiple times a night, you may have obstructive sleep apnea. And I'll explain why. But bedwetting in children, attention deficit disorder in children, depression, not to mention insomnia, and early death. And uh, yeah, there is dementia and memory loss there. So traditionally, medical doctors would send you for a sleep study and then they'd go, oh, you have obstructive sleep apnea. We got to shove air down your throat and we're going to put on this gas mask called a CPAP machine, which, by the way, can be life-saving if you have severe sleep apnea. So when we treat uh, obstructive sleep apnea with uh, an expansion of the airway to correct the problem and not just treat the symptom, sometimes we have patients have to wear this while we're doing the treatment because they're at such risk of a heart attack or, or, or a stroke. So you see the tongue in the middle here. So what this does is this forces air to open back here in the back of your throat because the teeth are strangling the tongue. The tongue could be tied. So the attachment of your tongue to the lower jaws by a ligament called the lingual frenulum Many, many people. So we routinely examine you for this. And we do something called a, a home sleep study as well. But yeah, this is a CPAP machine. It is, um, you know, it is forced air. And what happens when you use this for a long period of time, it stretches the tissue here. So it's almost like blowing a balloon up too much. Now, if you don't have the CPAP on one night, your, your sleep apnea is even worse. 
So the correction is something called a DNA appliance. And what does it do? It takes this narrow arch with a high vaulted palate and we're able to expand the arch. And here's before and after of a cone beam of the airway. Here is before this person is breathing through a coffee straw and here's after. Look at the breath from just expanding the space for your tongue so you can breathe. And what's the appliance that does it? This is a removable appliance. It's not a rapid palatal expanser like kids get that have a narrow palate, but this creates st steady arch development and activates stem cells for bone growth and does not cause inflammation. We fabricate these, they crank and expand in the middle. You wear them a couple nights a week and it's remarkable how the body adapts because those stem cells make new bone. We make new bone. Many times, orthodontists move teeth around and patients lose the buccal plate of bone. They're trying to move the teeth in unnatural positions without expanding the foundation, which is the jawbone. So this creates bone growth. It's a remarkable device. So 80% of individuals who have sleep apnea are unaware and the apnea can be present in children, babies, and excessive bedwetting um, um, and ADHD um, is related to sleep apnea, often misdiagnosed. So what do we do in our office? Um, we do an initial consultation and screening. We do this virtually. We have patients, uh, they can either get this um, CBCT at a center or in our office. And then we do in a complete assessment. Um, we use a home sleep study uh, and we do a sleep assessment. And um, we have a device we can send to you called a, um, um, yeah, I just forgot the name of the device. It is called, um, a, um, it's, a, it's a disposable home sleep system. And I'm sorry, the name uh, escapes me. I'll get it uh, in, in a moment. Um, and WatchPad, it's called the WatchPad, W-A-T-C-H-P-A-T, WatchPad device. All right, we're going to talk a little bit about TMJ, a really, really painful disorder. By the way, often people with sleep apnea, because of the arch being narrow, they often suffer from TMJ. And this appliance actually expands and helps to correct um, and eliminate TMJ disorders, uh, temporal mandibular joint dysfunction and pain. So TMJ and occlusal disease, I'd say about 80% of TMJ, it has to do with the dental arch. Um, other TMJ causes could be car accidents, a torn uh, joint, um, damage or disease in the meniscal disc. Uh, those are rarer, um, but most of it is the bite. And it manifests in many different ways from sinus pain to tinnitus or ringing in the ear, um, jaw pain, back pain, neck pain, all of this. Um, another interesting tidbit is Lyme patients who have cavitations, Lyme spirochetes just love the head and neck. And what happens is uh, they often get TMJ and they get stiff necks and, and, and all that stuff. So clicking or popping in the jaw joint is a sign of TMJ. Shoulders, back and neck pain, lack of mobility, stiffness, all related to TMJ. This is inflammatory. So the common symptoms like headache, jaw popping, pain and difficulty chewing, but then there is deep ear pain, sharp facial pain, dizziness, and again, neck and upper back muscle spasm and pain. So we look at occlusal disease. You know, are you breaking teeth? Are you clenching and grinding? Um, you know, are your teeth wearing and chipping all over the place? This is called occlusal disease. This is not normal. It's not like, oh, I have brittle teeth. It is... Um, teeth getting sensitive. Gum recession is often occlusal disease. 
the teeth are hitting like this and you get these clefts at the gum line, the bone at the gum line resorbs and the gums recede. Gums follow the bone. So gum recession, like severe gum recession, gum line cavities can be a sign of occlusal disease. So um, the TMJ is also directly related to cervical and the scapular region. Um, and it's an interrelated uh, neuromuscular system. So changes in the cervical spine can cause TMJ disorders and TMJ, T, excuse me, TMJ disorders can cause um, changes in the cervical spine. It's a bi-directional thing. And it's something that everyone should look at. And there's lots of different things we can do, including making um, an occlusal stent. Um, but a lot of times having proper reconstructive dentistry with a proper bite. I find that many dentists don't understand occlusion. And I find we call it iatrogenic disease, but dentists actually mess up the bite. And I know there are people shaking their heads up and down. It's like, oh, I had a cap. It never felt right. And my whole bite is off. And, and, uh, and that's because they don't, they don't understand occlusion. And I, I spend a lot of time with the dental students and dentists that I teach to help them to understand the importance of a balanced occlusion, a balanced oral ecology, and a balanced approach in the treatment of the patient. And looking at the patient holistically with everything, uh, not just um, what's going on in the mouth. Um, let's talk about this crazy, crazy area. Anybody walking into the toothpaste aisle in any pharmacy <laughs> or any store uh, is often like a mass of blue and you know lots of crazy, confusing things. Um, but I'm going to start with this. Uh, did you know? that the uh, that size tube of toothpaste there is enough sodium fluoride to be fatal to two children under five so i'll give you a quick story in 1988 um procter and gamble launched a product called crest sparkle toothpaste it was bubblegum flavored fluorescent blue and had sparkles in it a lot of you probably remember it and um Fluoride fatalities in children went up 280%. Horrifying. The internet wasn't around. Um, so you couldn't really, you know, you can't sequester information, although there's a, been a strong effort to do that and to censor uh, the intelligent exchange of scientific information, especially related to this pandemic. But back then, um, they can kind of sweep it under the rug. So... It took um, 10 years before the FDA put this warning on toothpaste with sodium fluoride because keep out of reach of children under six years of age. If more than a lot of times it says a pea sized amount is used for brushing. If more than used for brushing that little bit you put in your toothpaste is accidentally swallowed. They say get medical help or contact a poison control center right away. Um, that warning took 10 years and it's because toothpaste is toxic. And we're going to talk about the truth, uh, the real truth about health. Let's talk about the real truth about fluoride. Um, there are over 50, 50, 5 and I think it might even be up to 60 studies on drinking fluoridated water lowers IQ in children learning disabilities, behavioral order, uh, disorders, rapid aging, decreases in bone density and strength. I want to talk about that a moment, about osteoporosis. And, um, you know, 30 years after fluoride was introduced, about 25 to 30 years, the orthopedic groups decided to do hip fracture studies. And they wanted to see, because of the introduction of fluoride into the systemic water supply, that Fluoride makes teeth harder, stronger, stronger. And they found that they wanted to see if hip fracture rates were going down. They found an exponential increase. These are studies that were documented in the Journal of the American Medical Association, New England Journal of Medicine. Hip fracture rates went up exponentially with fluoridation, with the age, the age of fluoridation. Dentists and dental hygienists and dental students 
They get it rammed into them, brainwashed into them. Fluoride, you need fluoride, you need fluoride, you need fluoride, 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 fluoride. First of all, the stuff we put in the water isn't even fluoride. It's hydrofluorosilicic acid, a toxic chemical. They have to wear hazmat suits to dump it into the New York water supply or any municipal water supply. Hazmat suits. And hydrofluorosilicic acid, by the way, is an industrial waste product from aluminum manufacturing, phosphate fertilizer industry, and um, and the um, enrichment of uranium. So we have three big special interest groups there, starting with the U.S. military. And then we also have uh, Monsanto and who's the other one? Alcoa. Okay. And it's a very convenient way. New York pays, I think, $9 million dollars to put this garbage into the water supply. So what does fluoride do that we thought it was such a good thing? Because there were studies in the late 40s and 50s, Grand Rapids, Michigan, that the introduction of fluorine, because fluoride's a made up word, um, fluorine is the most highly reactive, non-radioactive element you know, on the planet. Um, and it quickly, when you introduce fluorine, which we call fluoride, it quickly changes the mineral of teeth and bones, which is hydroxyapatite. And the fluorine pushes out the hydroxy and where we end up with fluorapatite. So what we did in dental studies is, oh, wow, this causes enamel to remineralize. The problem is the mineral is not hydroxyapatite. The mineral is fluorapatite and it's 30% weaker. 30% weaker and less elasticity than hydroxyapatite is fluorapatite. So everything we thought good about fluoride, I'm still trying to find something good about it because there are fluoridated communities in the United States that have higher rates of decay than non-fluoridated, like New Hampshire per capita. And we have an increased risk of cancer that's been documented, cognitive decline, autoimmune disease. Then um, there was the idea that um, we would put um, try and kill plaque, right? We have to kill plaque, the germ theory, you know, from the 1970s, we put things in to try and kill, kill, kill. Um, and so there's a chemical called triclosan. Uh, that was the original ingredient in Colgate Total, which did a good job of killing, killing plaque. Uh, the problem is uh, that it was linked to cancer and growth malformations in animals. And it was approved by the FDA in 1997. Um, the FDA used, <laughs> this is another company-backed evidence to approve it. Um, and then you had advertisements like this, that Colgate eliminates 15 times more bacteria to improve the health of your mouth. So it's making that desert that I spoke about on the oral microbiome, kill everything, scorch, scorched earth policy. And yes, that's my bitmoji on the left. Um, so these approaches are not only ineffectual, but harmful. And um, I spent 20 years, I introduced uh, the first prebiotic oral care formulation. This is Revitin, Revitin, whatever you want to call it. I think in the intro uh, to this talk, they called it Revitin and my French son-in-law calls it Revitin, but Revitin, um, it's a kind of a play on words with revitalized vitamin. Um, it's loaded with uh, the patents we got were CoQ10 and vitamin C, which are amazing for the gums for reducing inflammation, vitamin D3 and K2, maniquilone 7, vitamin E. All of this was, and then we have micro minerals, but it's natural. You can eat this. This is basically a dietary supplement in a toothpaste. And it took me 10 years to get it to work like a toothpaste. And so we did some clinicals. And we found that in seven days of use, we reduced gingival inflammation more than Colgate was reporting in their studies from the Philippines in, in, uh, in four months or 12 weeks. Um, I mean, three months, I'm sorry, in one, in three months. So in seven days, we did more than three months. So we were looking at another study that we did in Europe um, in, in Italy to stay away from the FDA and, uh, and being called, uh, a, um, um, I, I guess an investigative, um, new drug because basically everything out of here came out of a 
came out of a health food store, basically a dietary supplement. And uh, we even toyed with um, using the um, um, brush and swallow. <laughs> that just sounded gross. <laughs> so, so I actually instruct patients to rub this on their gums if they have an area of inflammation. And so in 14 days, we're talking about two weeks, everyone, there was a 42% reduction, 46% reduction in unhealthy plaque and gum stop bleeding 72.5%. We now have a 50 patient double blind clinical study, but I'm pointing this out. The, the remarkable thing is of, of these results is that it's a very simple approach and it's called make peace with your microbes. It's called respecting the science of the oral microbiome. That bacteria are not invade us. As a matter of fact, a lot of scientists like myself believe we're made of bacteria, that our mitochondria of our cells may have been bacterial in origin at one time. And so what we want to do is understand the unique relationship of man and microbe that goes back to when man was made. Um, these were a uh, periodontal chart. Um, this guy ran up to me at a meeting I was doing in Atlanta, Georgia. And on the left, he said, he came to me and said, my dentist wants to do gum surgery on me. And I have all this bleed. I have all these pockets, four millimeters, five millimeters. Blah, blah, blah. And he said, can I get some of your product? I gave him three tubes. It's a tube a month. And um, in September, I was speaking out West. It was in um, Las Vegas. And he came running after me and said, guess what? Guess what? On the left was his chart when he saw me in June and in September um, or October, when I was giving this talk at the beginning of October, this was his exam with his dentist in, um, in, June, in, in uh, September. And he had out of all those black dots, which were bleeding gums, he had three left. And he said, even those went away since then. And, and it's the first time I ever did a HIPAA release on a uh, paper napkin at a Marriott hotel. Um, but I actually scanned it because I, I, I want, I want to change two things I'd like to accomplish before I leave the planet is I want to bring dentistry back into the fold of medicine. And I want to change how people take care of their teeth. And so the five steps, as I sum up here, um, the five steps that all of you can do to biohack your body through your mouth is number one, Get a cone beam, scan, cone beam scan, a CBCT, and a watch pad, remember the name, watch pad sleep study. Um, we can send that to you if you want. We have them in our office offices in, um, our, uh, in our offices. And, and if you reach out, we're happy to send you a home sleep study, which then gets read by a respiratory therapist and our airway health dentist who is the national advisor in airway health for the Vivo system. Um, number two, remove infected root canals, toxic non-biologic fillings, failing fillings, and treat jaw cavitations. Jaw osteonecrosis should be treated. And it's not just benign. We culture what's in there. I actually take a sterile paper point and culture what's in these cavitations and you'd be amazed. Everything from... Lime, candida, mold, parasites, metals, uh, all kinds of things. Number three, treat your airway. If you have a deficient airway, it must be treated if you want to live a longer, healthier, and happier life because depression is very related to suffocating at night in your sleep. You want to support your immune system before, during, and after dentistry, um, with, um, we have all different, uh, nutritional protocols. You're going to hear from, I'm sure a wonderful group of, um, nu um, nutritionists and people who have done tremendous research in the nutritional world. But I always, it's all about supporting your immune system. Um, so, uh, number five, you want to avoid harsh natural or chemical containing toothpaste and mouthwash, by the way, xylitol is in a lot of dental products. And there was junk science from Finland that, uh, that xylitol kills bacteria, so it makes your mouth healthier. No, it kills strep mutans bacteria because it is a chemical that is neither absorbed or metabolized by the human body. Xylitol was invented by a subsidiary of DuPont. Um, 
uh, Daniska, uh, and they found a brilliant way to take a bio waste, 80% of the original xylem, the GMO corn cobs, and, and, and take the xylem from that, and through a process of hydrogenation, make a, um, make a white chemical that is a sweetener. It's the new methadone for the sugar industry. So organic whole leaf stevia, not uh, xylitol. So, uh, so at any rate, we, um, sorry about that, everyone. Um, so you want to um, really um, use a product. I, I introduced my product, Revitin. You can go to revitin.com. Uh, there's no other product absolutely no other product on the planet right now um, that takes that approach. Uh, and so really uh, take the junk out of the trunk, open your medicine cabinet, take out the alcohol mouthwash, take out the essential oils that kill bacteria. By the way, you know, triclosan works as good as tea tree oil in killing and nuking the microbiome. So does peppermint oil. So does this. So there's a lot of natural dental products that are pure garbage, that have no science, that don't support uh, a rebalancing of the oral microbiome. So I am going to give this back to the moderator, stop the share here, and uh, I'd love to answer some of your questions. Um, wow, thank you, Dr. Kiritola. Um, my name is Ben, I'm here with The Real Truth About Health. and. You know, I'm just going to say on a personal note, I've been with the, this is our ninth annual conference. I believe it's number nine. I've been here, gosh, at least five or six of them and never seen a presentation like this. I am uh, like all of us enlightened and outraged. <laughs> um, <laughs> really? But thank you. Thank you on behalf of all of us. And, and so that said, yeah, we're going to get into our Q and a session. This was amazing. Um, before we do tell us again, I just want to make sure everybody knows um, tell us a little bit more about, you know, is there a book? Uh, where can people reach you if they want to reach you? Just tell yeah. us more. about. Well, I, you know, I want to make this guide. Everything I talked about, um, I put in this guide and it has a lot of information. And I want to make this available free for everyone subscribing to The Real Truth About Health. Um, I had spoken to Stephen about this as well. I even have a little card that you can give your dentist. <laughs> So, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm here and I, I love speaking to everyone and there's a lot of hands up and I want to get to everybody, but I really want, I want everyone. It's like that. It's like the moving network. I want everyone to stick their heads out the window <laughs> and tell their dentist I'm mad as hell and I'm not going to take it anymore. <laughs> and yeah. so, and, but I also wanted to, and I alluded to it a few times, Ben, talking about the fact that you're not going to cleaning up your mouth. I always tell patients because they come in and they're freaked out by all this stuff going on and they've got thyroid problems. They've got autoimmune problems. They've had Lyme suffering with chronic Lyme. They have gut issues. They have so many problems and their mouth is a toxic mess and they're freaking out. And the first thing I tell them is we're fixable in Cleaning up your mouth is like turning a battleship around. You just don't make a U-turn. You just don't go and rip everything out. You just don't, you know, take this extreme approach, but you take a rational, and this is where a good biologic dentist will give you a rational protocol for the sequencing and the priorities that you should address with what's going on in your mouth. Uh, thank you. Uh, really. Thank you so, so much for that. Um, we, we really, really appreciate that. And the fact that you're going to answer some live Q and a for us is also phenomenal. Uh, again, we're very grateful. And so before we do that, I just want to explain how we go about that here at the real truth about health conference. Um, so that you and our audience knows, and I think a lot of our audience already knows, um, yes, that is that we normally, uh, don't go right to the chat box for our questions, but we will ask everyone to raise their hand, their virtual hand. Um, and so what we do is, um, it, and by the way, if any of you out there are not sure how to raise your hand, what you do is, is down at the bottom of your uh, Zoom screen, 
you should have a reactions tab and uh, you go ahead and click on that reactions tab. You'll see a function that says raise hand. You click on that uh, and then we'll see the raise hands come in. We will select the raise hands in the order in which they came in. And uh, what I'll do is I'll actually ask each of you uh, when it's your turn, I'll unmute you and uh, we'll ask you to go right ahead with your, with your question. Uh, and so if you're ready, doctor, we're, I think we're set. Great. Great. Thank you so, so much. And will you help me? Will you help me with the hands? And then I'll answer the questions. That's exactly right. I'm going okay, to, uh, I'm going to set them up and you knock them down. <laughs> <laughs> Good. Um, okay, great. So with that, Let's go ahead to uh, the first person in line and forgive me. I hope I'm getting your name right. Is it is it Kylie or Kaylee? I'm going to go ahead and ask you to unmute. Let's do that for you. And I think you're safe. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, and yes, it's Kaylee. And in the last year and a half, they did what you said is ripping out everything from my mouth. Right. Everything all at one time. And they've put in uh, zirconium or titanium uh, implants four on top, four on the bottom. What do I do now? They're still adjusting my bite, which is not, not working. Mm -hmm. um, and what do I do? I, th I think what you, what you had is called all on four. Um, it, it was very popular yes. with, with Dennis. I'm quite yes. honestly, um, your quality of life and having teeth and being able to chew um, is going to be enhanced by you having a fixed prosthesis on the implants. I think the, the, and this is a great question, by the way, because they went and they did this and, um, and they, they're probably titanium because most of the all on four systems use the metal implants. So they're new and they're in there. My advice to you is your home care and your maintenance of that is really important to prevent corrosion, to prevent the breakdown of these, and you need to be monitored. I would not remove it because that's almost more traumatic at this point, as you can imagine. So I would really, and, and it's important that if your bite is not balanced, that you make that clear and you find another dentist if they can't get your bite right, because it's really important that you avoid getting TMJ. And that's why I had that down in one of my top uh, inflammatory uh, issues, that TMJ and occlusion are really important. The joint, the TMJ joint has to be in balance and your bite has to be in balance. As far as the metal implants go, yes, they're a concern down the road. Uh, they can be. Um, but if they were just placed, you're not really in danger unless they start to corrode, which is where I showed those very, very ugly pictures of the gums turning blue and purple and all that. Uh, thank you so, so much for that, doctor. And up next, I'm going to ask Sophia to uh, go ahead with your question. I believe you are. Let's see if I can get you to unmute here. Um, Sophia, I'm trying to unmute you, but if you can do it on your end, let's have you do it. Uh, a little bit of an issue unmuting Sophia. So I tell you what, Sophia, stay with us. I'm going to move on to the next person and then we'll try to come back to you. And so, uh, again, I hope I'm, I'm saying your name correctly. Is it Ainsley? Let me go ahead and ask you to unmute. I'm going to unmute. Oh, there you go. Ainsley. Hi, Ainsley. Oh, we muted again. Okay, let's try this one more time. It's like live TV, right? <laughs> okay, Ainsley, are you there? Hi, are you hearing me? We are yes. now. Thank you. All right, Ainsley Amarali from Trinidad in the West Indies, Caribbean. Yeah. I'm a Caribbean boy here. This is my third year in the conference. Love it always. My question for Dr. is... Um, I did bonding when I was very young. I was playing the fool in the yard and I fell and I chipped my tooth and they did bonding. From being older now, I'm, I'm always asking my dentist, what are they doing? I'm, I'm, that's my parrots in the background. Um, <laughs> yeah, we are Caribbean people. And um, she told me it's a 3M product. And okay. um, I'm pretty nervous now about it. Also, when you were talking about your toothpaste, the re, re, revitin, revitin um, I went to Amazon 
is Amazon also credible to buy your toothpaste? And yeah. how do we get your toothpaste in our country? So that's a three question. It's 3M, okay. and I'll no, out. Can I, you trust I, Amazon? And um, how can we get your toothpaste in my country? Thanks again. Wonderful. Um, I, can, I can answer that very quickly. Um, uh, Revitin is available uh, through Amazon. And by the way, I, I have many, many wonderful friends from Trinidad. I often spend a lot of time in, I actually have a license to do dentistry in Barbados. And there is a dentist in Barbados who's going to be distributing to the whole basin. And I know that's a, a sister country uh, uh, to, um, to Trinidad. Um, uh, his name is Dr. Lon Clark, C-L-A-R-K-E. Um, but you can get it through Revitin. My office manager here in East Hampton, uh, is from Trinidad. <laughs> so, and uh, as far as the bonding goes, I would not replace it. The 3M product is not BPA free, but if it is not, corro- it, it, you know, you'll know if the composite loses its shine that it's breaking down. My advice to you in terms of the fractured tooth is you might consider a porcelain laminate. Porcelain is always one of the most um, biologically acceptable materials in the mouth. The soft tissue loves porcelain. But again, if the bonding was done recently, I really wouldn't change it. But I would always uh, try and direct um, the dentist um, who you're working with to use a BPA-free material, and they should do that research on their own. Doctor, thank you so much for that. And uh, as we go back into our list of raised hands and everyone, um, you, you know, we have about 15 minutes left. And, uh, and again, thank you for being so gracious with us, doctor. Um, you know, if you I'm can shorten my answers, so more people can ask. No, no, that's great. And, and in fact, what we'll do is we'll ask everyone, if you can, you know, we, we love that people are staying on point. If you can keep it to one question, that would be ideal to make sure we get uh, everybody a chance. And so I'm going to try to go back to Sophia here. Sophia, let's see if I can unmute you. And Sophia, I am having an issue with unmuting you. So um, I don't know if you want to drop your hand and then raise back in again. We will get to you. I'm going to move on now to Sarah. Sarah, I'm unmuting you for your question. Hi, Sarah. Hi, Dr. Jerry. It's Sarah from your office. And (laughs) I am calling because you held up that pamphlet and I would love to send it to everyone digitally. And I put in my email so I can send it to you. I also, um, it's in the chat and I also put in a special discount code just for this group. The discount code is truth 15%. If you put that in, you will get 15% off on, um, your purchase. It's good for the whole month. Wonderful. Thank you, Sarah. I thought that was you. (laughs) Thank you for helping with that. Yes, thank you. And again, thank you for, for being so gracious with that and, and sharing that for free as well, that, that pamphlet with everybody. That's that's really amazing. Let's go now to Tracy. Tracy, I'm going to ask you to, um, let's see if I can unmute you here. Uh, Tracy, you're on with the doctor. Thank you. Hello. I missed the first half of this. So my question is, um, is salt good to use instead of toothpaste? Salt? Yeah, I've had good results myself, and I wanted to know if I could use a, it on my daughter. To, so you, you wet, yeah. the, wet the toothbrush, yeah, so sprinkle a little salt. What's, what's the, um, so what are the benefits of, of, of salt? Salt is, um, creates an osmotic gradient. So if the gums are inflamed, it helps fluids in the inflamed tissue to drain, right? We recommend salt water for a lot of things in the mouth and, and salt on the tissue. Here's the only thing that I have to say about that is that um, especially for young children, there really wasn't a suitable product for young children, in my opinion, um, until I developed Revitin. And it's one of the, you know, I was at Harvard Medical School in complementary and alternative medicine. And I came out of that program and I was like, toothpaste is garbage. It was flavored detergent for the mouth. It was invented by soap makers 150 years ago. And really uh, a study from Japan, I, I found in the 1970s, found that the two ingredients that are most important um, for the health of the oral tissue is vitamin C and CoQ10. As a matter of fact, everyone, and Sarah's giving 15%, if I could get rid of every product, if I, could, if I had to get rid of every vitamin but one, 
it, it, the one I would keep in my medicine cabinet is vitamin C. Vitamin C, you know, that's where they found scurvy and sailors on boats. They found it was a deficiency in vitamin C, but vitamin C is so important for the body. And this vitamin C, I actually developed this. This is a liposomal vitamin C that liposomal delivery, a lot of absorption. So salt, I would really, I understand you're, you're using that and you've been having good results in terms of cleaning it up, but you really want to kind of feed your children's smile, feed, feed their gums. And that's where vitamins are really important. And that's why Revitin is basically a vitamin delivery for the mouth. Uh, excellent. Thank you. Thank you, uh, uh, Dr. Curatola. And uh, up next, we have Steph O. I am going to unmute you. Hi, Steph. Hi, how you doing? Um, I'm, I came late, so please forgive me if you've already addressed this. But recently, I've been um, brushing my teeth, and I noticed there's like my gums bleed when I brush my teeth. And I know it's related with cardiovascular issues and stuff, which I do have. So what would, what, would, what would your advice be to me moving forward of how to get this together? Yeah, so that's a sign of gingivitis, which, which was a major thing that I talked about, a sign of it's the body's number one source of chronic low-grade inflammation. So you really need to, first of all, I would definitely get professional uh, a professional examination and a professional cleaning, um, but because you may have been overdue, a lot of people during this shutdown we've come through this past you know number of years, and and a lot of people have avoided going to the dentist and and didn't go to the dentist. And I I actually um, petitioned with the governor in the state of New York to say that we're going to create bigger problems because preventative health is just as important as, uh, you know, it's an important part of your immune health. So I petitioned for, for, to open the dental, the dental offices open before any other healthcare practice patients, you know, were staying away from the dentist, their gums were bleeding. They, they were getting lots of inflammation. So, um, believe it or not, Revitin would help you as well, because it's really effective in reducing gingival bleeding. So um, get a checkup, get a cleaning, use a good home oral care product like Revitin, take vitamin C. Vitamin C is great for bleeding gums. Scurvy, the gums bleed, bled like crazy. This is called optimal C and it's liposomal delivery. You just do a teaspoon, keep it under your tongue for 30 seconds or so and swallow. Um, very, very good dietary supplement for bleeding gums. Thank you so much, doctor. Uh, all very valuable information for us. And I'm going to move on now to Janet P. Janet P, I am on mute. Hi, Janet. Hi, Janet. Janet. Oh, there we go. Hi, there we how go. are you? <laughs> thank you. Um, thank you. I, um, my question is, I regularly got my teeth cleaned and my dentist. I'm from the Chicagoland area, Illinois. I have waived the full um, uh, x-rays that they want to do every few you know, years, and it's been five years, and each time I waive the x-rays, I, um, I have to sign a uh, waiver that they are, you know, that I'm okay with it because they truly want to x-ray my entire mouth, and I've read pros and cons about it. Well, it's been five years and I was told at my appointment that I can no longer see this dentist if I do not allow them in a five-year period to x-ray my teeth. So what, what's the deal on that? Is it, I okay. have a healthy mouth, I'm, I eat plant-based whole food and I don't have any problems with my mouth. Do I need x-rays? Uh, that is a fantastic question because yes, the older... The older dental x-rays and, you know, dentists were like, oh, you get checkup x-rays every time you go. You get these little, uh, they're called bite wing x-rays. And then you do a full series every three to five years where we look at everything. It's a bit of a dilemma because I'm going to tell you something that, um, you know, what you see above the gum is the tips of the iceberg and what's under the gum is, is a host of different problems. I often had a brochure of what is shown by dental radiographs. 
tumors, infections, uh, fractured teeth, all kinds of things. So I am not a fan of dental x-rays because ionizing radiation is cumulative. Now, digital x-rays, 90% less ionizing radiation. So that's good. Make sure it's a digital system when you get an x-ray taken. I do not believe we use, my dental hygienist uses, so the bite wing x-rays are to check for cavities between your teeth um, that may be forming. And there's other technologies we have now called transillumination. So we have a transillumination device that actually illuminates your tooth and you could see a dark shadow, um, which is better than taking an x-ray. But a general set of x-rays when you start in a dental office is an important protocol, but they make sure that they're digital. Final thing, um, it's easier to do a CBCT, which shows everything, um, and it's less exposure than doing 18 pictures um, uh, to do the, uh, the holistic CBCT which is a cone beam computerized tomography. Again, another technology with very low exposure, very, um, very, very effective clarity of everything that's going on. But you know what? Unfortunately, dental x-rays are necessary. If you can't, you can't continue to go to the dentist without knowing what's going on below. Remember, what was, what was below the uh, surface of the water is what sunk the Titanic. Okay, so you're looking at the tip of the iceberg, look on, we need to see what's underneath to effectively treat you, competently treat you. Thanks for that, doctor. Uh, and, and we have a few minutes left. Um, I'm hoping we can get to every question. Uh, and let's go ahead with Andrea next. I'm unmuting you now, Andrea. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Hi, Dr. Jerry. Uh, Hi, nice Andrea. to see you again. I saw you on the Holistic Dental Summit. And um, I actually started using your toothpaste since then. Have Great product. It. I can attest to that. <laughs> now, I noticed that you showed a chart in the beginning that showed how tooth uh, relates to organs. Now, the question is, um, if you have missing teeth, how does that impact your organs? And is there anything that you can do to counteract any adverse effects from the missing teeth? Teeth. That's that's a brilliant, a brilliant question. So Thank what you. happens when you lose teeth? The importance of those meridians is that the blockage is removed. So if there's disease, let's say you had a tooth removed, but there's still an abscess in the bone, that will negatively affect meridian flow and energy flow to that organ system. So again, it's like the breaker is pop. But if the tooth is removed and the bone is healthy, meridian flow can continue. For example, metal implants, metal implants, I didn't share this and I'm glad, glad you pointed this out, is that metal implants where a tooth was lost and you put a metal implant in, blocks meridians. Ceramic or zirconia implants do not block meridians. So the importance is not whether the tooth is there or not, but that whether the meridian flow is blocked by disease or toxicity. Okay. You yeah. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you, doctor. And now we have Lori. Lori, I'm going to unmute you. Okay, we've got you, Lori. Okay, thank you so much. Oh, this is like absolutely aha eye opening um, of my entire life. And um, so I'm a little bit emotional about it. Um, the water that I was that I drank um, in Pennsylvania was fluoridated as a youth. I had amalgam fillings in all of my baby teeth before I was eight years old. Um, then those subsequently as teeth grew in, continued to have dental decay, um, had a lot of shame related because I was accused of not taking care of my mouth. I used toothpaste, I used mouthwash. Um, I brushed regularly um, three to five times a day because I felt so embarrassed. Um, I ended up having eight teeth pulled um, and braces put in to close my mouth. I have sleep apnea. I have cardiovascular issues. Um, all of the mercury fillings deteriorated over time. They were subsequently replaced, but with the plastic um, fillings. And then um, I have now had um, implant surgery because I had the roots of my teeth um, cracked 
underneath the teeth. Like, so the roots cracked and disintegrated. Mm -hmm. And so those teeth were removed. So then on top of that, and, and you did discuss a little bit, I put the question in the box, but um, my daughter um, suffers from a neurological multiple seizure disorder and she is allergic to metals. She does not have any dental fillings, any cavitations um, in her mouth. So I hold a lot of guilt for the mercury that was in my system that I passed on to my hero. Yes. Yes. And I don't know the half-life and all of that, but how do we detoxify the dental assault? Okay. That's a, it's a great question. And Laura, you know, my heart um, goes out to you. Everything that you've shared, you basically, you were, um, I hate to use the word victim, but you were a victim of conventional dentistry and everything they did to you and the, and the shame and everything else. And that's really important. And, you know, one of the greatest things that, that I love to do is to restore patients like you and give you a life back. Um, I did a, um, mouth makeover once on the Dr. Oz show. And, and it was about a woman who had a story like yours. And we, we turned that battleship around and got her in the right direction and just giving her that and correcting that. And I would urge you to stay on the path because you're fixable. You are fixable. It may take more time. It may, but you're fixable. Our, your body, like my body, wants to self-regulate and heal. But let's talk about your daughter and how to deal with that. And how do you detox from mercury? I'm so glad you asked that because I didn't cover it. And it is getting mercury out of the body is like peeling layers of an onion. Okay. You do it slow and gradual. And then there's another layer and there's another layer. I'm going to tell you a quick story. 25 years ago, um, I'm practicing 39 years. It'll be 40 years in September in private practice. And, um, and about 25 years ago, I never put a mercury filling in when I, from when I came out of dental school, but I was removing them unsafely. And so I started to get brain fog and, and, um, you know, I, I forget, couldn't remember telephone numbers. And then, you know, I'd walk in a room and forget why I walked in the room. Um, I did forget the name of that watch pad device on the show, on the show today, but that's probably a senior moment. But um, the reality is, is one morning I woke up and I had a tremor in my hand and I thought I had a brain tumor. I didn't once think I was mercury toxic because I was like, I don't do mercury fillings but I didn't understand the impact of removing them unsafely. So my process of cleanup of the mercury was slow and gradual. You do not want to get an IV chelation in your arm because if you push mercury out of the body too quickly, um, it just redistributes. You're not able. And so there's a, um, a very dear friend, uh, Dan Pompa, um, who does a Pompa program and there's three parts. The first part is called um, prep phase, and that opens up the downstream pathways. And the second phase is body phase of starting to get um, toxins and metals out of tissue. And then the third is brain phase, getting past the blood brain barrier and to remove that. So remember, the, there are building blocks to eliminate mercury. And my one major piece of advice is slow and steady. It may take two years to clean up toxicity of metals and your daughter will be fine. She will, she's, I think it's important to get it out um, and for her to follow the, the same protocols um, and you yourself as well. And additionally, um, with, you talked about the teeth and the cavitations. So are, are we still recommending um, wisdom teeth removal surgery? That's, that's another very good question. So, you know, there have been uh, anthropological studies done on the human jaw over the ages, and we find that there are deformities in the jaw that happen epigenetically from damage to the DNA in, pre in preceding generations where the jaw is too small for the tooth to come in. So, yes, do wisdom teeth still get removed? Yes. Do I remove wisdom teeth the way I was taught in dental school? No, I graft every tooth that comes out. Every tooth that comes out gets treated with PRF and a graft material so that the bone can heal. I use a laser. 
I stimulate the surrounding bone to heal. So the answer uh, again is yes, there are, I think many wisdom teeth come out unnecessarily. It's not a rite of passage. They need to be evaluated, but secondarily, we follow a protocol that's different than what we used to do, fortunately, to prevent the formation of cavitations in the future. Now, how do I find a doctor? We're going to have to uh, cut you off there. Yeah, yeah, that, that's fine. Um, Lori, I'd be happy if you contact us. I'd be happy to advise you uh, separately from that and, and help to advise what you can do. Th thank you again, doctor. I'm, I, I'm sorry to everyone that we need to cut the Q&A. Yeah. Yes, just, I'm sorry about that, too. No, no, that's OK. We, we are thrilled to have you. And and, um, and, and as I said, this is uh, just an outrage. And we're you're a stand for all of us. And we really, really appreciate that you came here to be here at the conference with us. Um, and, and it just means a lot. So, yes, thank everyone, uh, go you. ahead and make sure you follow up with uh, Dr. Curatola as soon as you can. Uh, doctor, thank you. Uh, we hope you stay with us and, and keep watching because there's more, uh, more Real Truth About Health. We're coming up next with Dale Bredesen uh, momentarily. And uh, wow, the uh, the Real Truth keeps coming. So thank you, Dr. Curatola. In fact, I'm Pleasure. not the only one that wants to thank you. I know I'm not the only one. If our tech <laughs> would unmute everybody, uh, what do you want to say? Uh, our, our entire audience, what do you want to say? Oh, thank you so much. Thank you so much. <laughs> thank you. 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 Thank you.